Peter, open your Bibles to Romans 4 and turn your brain on extra high. <laughs> because we're going to talk about some things that might be difficult to comprehend. Well, so you can tell me after the lesson whether that's the case or not. But we're talking about imputed righteousness, and by the way, Nathan did a good job selecting songs that actually go with the sermon, and Tim did an excellent job this morning. Those songs were very appropriate and fit very well with what I was preaching on. Uh, we're covering subject in Romans that our Bible class uh, doesn't cover, so we'll talk about Romans 5 later on in Romans 7, and that'll be real fun for song leaders, but <clears throat> can't help that. It's in the Bible, and we need to know it. But when we talk about imputed righteousness, obviously from Romans 4, there is a biblical doctrine of imputed righteousness. It's not hard to understand. It's very simple and, and straightforward. Uh, but there are also several false views on the subject. For example, the Calvinistic doctrine that talks about the imputed righteousness of the life of Christ. And so they say Christ's own life and his actual righteousness is put on your account. And also the Catholic doctrine of infusion, where like a transfusion, Christ's actual righteousness is transfused or infused into you so that you actually have what he had. Both of those doctrines are false, and that's what leads to the necessity of this sermon. So starting off, what do we mean by the term imputation or impute? It simply means to credit to a person or a cause. That's Webster's definition for it, and that's really what it means. It's an accounting term. But the false theory that goes with it is the idea of ascribing righteousness to someone by virtue of a similar quality in another. And as that applies to religion, those who believe in taking Christ's own actual righteousness and putting it on someone else's account... Uh, that's what they're trying to do. For example, it says Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And there's a threefold imputation that John Calvin put forth, and you'll recognize most of these. Uh, you may not have always put them together, but number one, the imputation of Adam's sin to mankind, that we all inherit Adam's sin. So a newborn baby who's done nothing wrong is, is a depraved child because he has had Adam's sin imputed to him. Now you may not believe that, but a lot of people do. Number two, the imputation of men's sins to Christ. That we take all of our sins and put them on Christ, and now he's literally and actually sinful because he's bearing our sins in his body. And then the third one is the imputation of the personal righteousness of Christ to the believer. So once Christ has been sacrificed, now we take his personal righteousness and apply it to the believer, and so none of those are true, but that's what Calvinism teaches, for example. Then the Catholics teach the doctrine of infusion, and pardon me while I read their definition. They say, hence justified persons are both imputed with Christ's righteousness and infused with his life. Did you hear that? Imputed and infused. They are declared righteous because in virtue, of Christ, in virtue of Christ's indwelling life and holiness, they really are righteous. But what they're saying is they're righteous because all God sees is Christ's righteousness. But they really are righteous because Christ's own life is infused into theirs. It's interesting and rather theological, but it gets a little complicated, doesn't it? Have I lost anybody yet? Are you still with me? It's not that hard, but you kind of have to, if you're not used to believing like they believe, you have to think about it. What does the Bible's view of imputation of guilt teach? Very simple, Romans 3, 9. What then are we better than they know? In no wise, for we have, both, we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are what? All under sin. But again, we still ask the question, why are Jews and Gentiles all under sin? Are we all under sin because we all inherited Adam's guilt? Or are we, or are we all under sin because we have all sinned? And you know what Romans 3.23 says, all have 
sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the biblical view of man's guilt is he's guilty because he's done wrong. He's not guilty because he inherited something from Adam. He's not righteous because he inherited something from Christ. And he's not infused with it as though he's getting some kind of a righteousness transfusion like we'd get a blood transfusion. So we're dealing with the nature of man from the biblical standpoint and from these doctrinal standpoints. Again, the Calvinist says man is totally depraved because he's inherited all of Adam's guilt and therefore he can do nothing right. And again, a quote from them says, We are said to be justified through faith. Not in the sense, however, that we receive within us any righteousness. Now let's think about that a minute. We're justified, but not because we have in us any righteousness. Well, what do you have in you if you don't have any righteousness? We well, have a bunch of guilt. That's what they're saying. But because the righteousness of Christ is credited to us entirely as if it were really ours. While our iniquity is not charged to us. So what we're doing with the Calvinists is we're playing the shell game. Here's my guilt, but I put that under a shell and shake up a little bit. And what does God see? He sees Christ's righteousness. What's underneath my guilt? That's what he's saying by that quote there. Well, we're not really righteous. We just are playing righteous because God's covered us over. And the problem with that is it allows a church and a denomination to take in all kinds of wickedness and sin because they all say, well, we don't need to repent. We just need to accept Jesus and let him do it all. And all of his perfectness is, is all God sees. So underneath there, I can do all I want any time I want. Now, they may not teach that idea of you can go ahead and sin all you want. They teach a lot of the same things I do. I just don't know why. Because what they're really saying is our sin is not on, a, on any account or ledger. And righteousness, which is not ours, is there. And so that's the Calvinistic idea of uh, man's nature being totally depraved. But then the Catholics come along and they agree with the Calvinist. Yes, man's totally depraved because he's inherited Adam's sin. They teach the same thing. But this is a quote I want to read from out of... Uh, <clears throat> Let me find my notes. Out of the Roman Catholic Dewey version on Romans 3 and 4. And it says this. The first part of the quote's not on the screen. The justification of which St. Paul is speaking here is the infusion of sanctifying grace which alone renders a person supernaturally pleasing to God. You see, you didn't do anything, you just got it. But justification, that is an infusion of sanctifying grace, cannot be merited by us. It is entirely gratuitous gift of God. And then here's the important part. This internal renovation is essential for individuals who are both imputed with Adam's guilt and infused with his corrupt nature. So imputed, all it means is to put somebody's account. Because Adam sinned, you're guilty. That's like Ray going out and buying a new car and I look on my my credit report, and I've got $40,000 debt. That's not right. I didn't spend $40,000. Well, you inherited that and I raised debt. You wouldn't like that, would you? But that's what they're saying. That's what they mean by imputation. So again, he says, they are imputed with Adam's guilt and infused. So not only do I have the debt, I now have the bad part that goes with it. And whose fault is that? It's Adam's fault. It's not ours. So they say they are declared sinful at the same time they really are sinful. But according to that doctrine, they're really sinful because somebody shot them full of sin, not because they committed it. So if that's what you believe, then number two, justified persons are both imputed with Christ's righteousness and infused with his life. Isn't that interesting? That gets pretty complicated. I'm guilty because of Adam and I'm righteous because of Christ. And in the meanwhile, nothing I've done has anything to do with it. And you think, do people really teach that? Yes, they do. And here's what's really scary. There are preachers for the church of Christ who have taught this same doctrine. That's what's scary. That's why you need to be aware of it and be able to deal with that. So the biblical imputed righteousness is very simple. 
the righteousness that God imputes or counts to our ledger is because we have been forgiven of sins. Now there's the discussion in Romans 4, and that's what Paul's talking about. How can a man be righteous in a state of being right with a law system that only recognizes perfect obedience? In other words, you can't make one misstep under the law, and if you do, you're not righteous. Well, then the only way you can do that is by actually being righteous. Well, under God's system of grace and the gospel, how are you righteous? Well, you've already sinned. You're guilty of sin. So how can a man who's sinful and guilty be right? Well, the Bible says the blood of Christ forgives or washes that sin away. And so you really are righteous, not because you've never sinned, but because your sin has been removed by the blood of Christ. You see the difference? And let's read that in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verses uh, 10 through 12. It shows how men is, man is sinful. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Well, that sounds like total depravity, doesn't it? Except look at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul's quoting out of the Old Testament passages to show the Jews are sinners and in need of God's grace because living under the law of Moses, they were guilty of sin and none of them lived righteously. But what do you do then? Well, then you need what we see in Romans chapter 4. It says, what then, verse 1, shall we say about Abraham? If he was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, if Abraham lived a sinless life, then he, can, he deserves eternal life. Is that what they did with Abraham? No. It says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him or imputed to him for righteousness. But when Abraham believed God, what does that mean? Faith only? No, it means when God said Abraham do something, Abraham believed and did it. And you can look at the, the life of Abraham and see this. We've been talking in our Bible class. Today, when God said, Abraham, I need you to leave the land of your forefathers and go into a foreign land that I will show you and dwell in tents with your wife and son, uh, did he say, well, Lord, that's, that's a great plan. I'm going to do that and just sit there in Chaldea. No, he had to believe God and get up and leave home. Where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. He never did even tell them where they were going. So you see, Abraham's belief is a system of believing and trusting in God and God putting it on his account for being a right or righteous. But even in Abraham's life, there's the need of forgiveness because we have a record of several of his transgressions. And so he's called righteous, but it's because God forgave him of his sins, not because God put something to his account that wasn't his. So again, the word impute in the New Testament, nine times the Bible talks about faith being imputed to one. In other words, your faith is put to your account and your faith and obedience makes you righteous. When I believe the gospel, believe Jesus died for my sins and I am baptized for the remission of my sins, my sins are washed away and God says your faith is now accounted for righteousness. Two times, righteousness is imputed to one. In other words, he's righteous, and so on his account, God says he is now righteous because of what he's done. But zero times is Christ's own righteousness imputed to one. That doctrine isn't even in the Bible. So where did it come from? Man's imagination. But you see, when people you talk to uh, believe this, they'll say, well, look in Romans 4, there's imputed righteousness right there. And they read the verse and they kind of give you a snow job and make you believe something that the Bible doesn't teach. And so we need to go, we'll go on and come back to that in a minute. But look at the four possibilities of salvation for man once he has sinned. One is God could have said, okay, man's a sinner, there's no hope. And at the end of time, I'm going to destroy all mankind. And somebody says, well, that doesn't sound right. Well, it's close to right because look at Noah. In his lifetime, there were millions of people who were living sinfully, and God destroyed them all except Noah, his wife, three sons, and their wives. That's pretty close to extinction, isn't it? 
God could do that. The second possibility is you can save man in his sin. And that's what this imputed righteousness of the life of Christ is teaching. Man's still a sinner. He can repent, but he's not really changing. He's just saying, I'm sorry. And then he's saved, and he keeps on living a sinful life. All the while, they preach and say, you need to do right. <clears throat> Why? Because if you love God, you will. Not because if you don't, you're a sinner again. See the difference in how subtle that can be? The third possibility is that man can earn his salvation. And God gave the law of Moses for 1,500 years and said to the Jewish nation, if you can live under that law and go to heaven on that basis, have at it. And how many did that? Zero. What's left? Man can have righteousness imputed to him by virtue of his sins being forgiven. And look at Romans 4, 6 through 8 and see that's what the Bible teaches. It says in verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness, and that word blessedness means salvation. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. In other words, the works of the law. How can you be righteous without living a sinless life? Well, let's see how. Verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are what? Forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Now see, the Calvinist says covered up. Covered over. They're still there. So don't, let, don't fall for that because forgiven in the first line is synonymous with covered in the second line. And so there's more than one way to cover something. You can cover a person who's naked up with clothes, but they're still naked underneath, right? But here, covered means forgiven. You can also say, uh, I'm going to cover his debt. How are you going to cover his debt? I'm going to pay his bill. And that's the way it's used here. So blessed or saved are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. God won't put sin on my account. Why not? Because they've been forgiven. How's that? By the blood of Christ. Okay. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's what we read very plainly in Romans 6, 4, 6 through 8. Somebody says, well, how do people get all messed up? I don't know. I didn't write the Bible and I didn't write these denominational doctrines. We just inherited that. <clears throat> but another question is, is righteousness imputed to us unconditionally? Some teach that doctrine. Well, again, what does the Bible teach? Well, if it's unconditional, is it to everybody? Is everybody saved? There are those out there who teach universal salvation. I remember many, many years ago, I was driving home late one night from the meeting, I believe. I was tired and worn out, and so I'm listening to the radio, and luckily came across this talk radio show at 10 o'clock at night, and this guy is teaching universal salvation. I never actually heard it myself before. And he's explaining God is so loving and so kind and so long-suffering that everybody's going to heaven. I thought, boy, I wish I could believe that. So that people actually teach that. They're called universalists, obviously. But Jesus said, no. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father is in heaven. So if righteousness put on people's account was unconditional and automatic it'd be to everybody well okay if it's not to everybody is it to some well the answer again is no because in Matthew 25 and verse 34 Jesus Christ told us that in the judgment scene that uh, come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world again come you blessed are the ones who are forgiven and so there's obviously something to it. It's not just some unconditionally. Well, once again, if so, is it nobody? Well, the answer is nobody is saved unconditionally. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 says, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he who fears God and what? Works righteousness is accepted by him. So when God puts to my account the fact that I'm a righteous person, he does it not because he's biased toward me and, and not you. 
He does it because I fear God and I have obeyed His commands. I have worked righteousness. Not the work that earns it, but the work that is conditional and puts it on my account. I've obeyed the condition and therefore I've met what He said. So the point is, God requires action on man's part to be saved. But again, the Calvinists don't believe that. <clears throat> They're so inconsistent, it's really kind of, if it weren't serious, it'd be comical. But let's just stop and think about their mindset for a minute. Okay, man is totally depraved, and what that means is he cannot do anything good. And in their writings, they even make the comment, even if you try to do what is right, it's still wrong. So, boy, well, I mean, you're, you're lost. You can't, if you want to do right, go ahead and try. You can't. You're totally depraved. You're incapable of doing anything good. Well, if that were true, what's next? That man is lost and going to hell unless God does something for him that he can't do for himself. And that's what they teach. And so now they say, if that totally depraved man is saved, he'll be saved by what? Faith. Faith only. Now wait a minute, let's think about this. He can't do it. He can't have faith. Well, where does he get it? God gives it to him automatically, unconditionally, has to. And that's what they teach. He is so transformed by God's grace that automatically he believes. Well, I asked a fellow one time when I was over going to a computer class and there's a bunch of denominational preachers there. And at Wendy's I'm eating lunch and one of these fellows comes and sits down across from me and I asked him, I said, why do you preach to anybody? He said, what do you mean? I said, why do you preach? I said, don't you believe that God gives man faith unconditionally yeah so why do you preach them well he said well people ought to believe i said i agree with you now you're preaching my doctrine i said i preached him because i believe he has free will and can choose why do you do it you know what he said you're confusing me i said no you're confused when you showed up <clears throat> and i'm confused for you because i don't understand either they preach a lot like i do they tell people you need to believe in Jesus, you need to repent of your sins, you need to confess your faith. But all the while they say you're totally depraved, you can't do anything unless God does it for you. Well now let's follow that logic one more step. If you can't do anything and God chooses you unconditionally and arbitrarily and gives you everything you need to be saved, guess what the next step is? If God went to all that trouble to save you and you had nothing to do with it, do you think he's going to let you be lost after that? No, he's going to keep you saved. That's where they come up. And it's a very logical doctrine once you start believing that process. It's not ridiculous. If a man is totally depraved and can do nothing to help him, then God's got to help him or he's going to be lost. And yet if God helps him and does everything for him, he's going to do everything to make sure that he's saved. The problem with that is, he, here comes Sam Morris, a denominational preacher, and he says, Every sin in the catalog of sins can be committed by that saved person, and he is not lost. That sin will not be charged to his account. You know why? Because Sam Morris believed in the imputed righteousness of Christ's life. You can sin under here all you want because all God sees is this life of Christ. So there's no real repentance. There's no real change if you don't want to. But they preach just as hard as I do about being faithful and coming to church and giving of your means and all that. And you know why? And their answer always to me has been, well, if you love God, you're going to do that. Yeah, but do you have to? Pin them down. No, you don't have to. In that case, I'm staying home watching football. How about you? You see? So it is a serious thing because people are taught this stuff. Well, is man actually righteous according to the Bible? When God forgives him of his sin, is he actually righteous or is he playing righteous like these Calvinists and Catholics teach? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, their lawless deeds, I will what? Remember no more. Now again, if you look at that, does God have amnesia? The next question is, why does he remember them no more? And the answer is, as you know, because the blood of Christ washed them away in obedience to the gospel. So they're really righteous. Number two, 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. 
He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Now why, John, would you write that? Because people were teaching this same false doctrine back in his day in the first century. It's amazing, isn't it? He said, don't let anybody deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. But what doctrine was going around in John's day was by the Gnostics is it doesn't matter what your body does because your body is, is earthly and material and all material things are evil. So what you do is you accept this Gnostic, this knowledge that we have, this special information, and it lifts your spirits up above this world and your mind is up in the clouds and you're in fellowship with God and all the while your body's down here sinning like the devil. That's what John was fighting. And he said, don't be fooled by that. The guy who says, well, I have special knowledge and I'm up here in the heavens. If he's not living a righteous life with his physical body, then he's not righteous. Okay? We can see that. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. In other words, not by personal merit. But according to his mercy, he saved us. All right, how did he save us? How did he make unrighteous people righteous? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, faith and baptism. <clears throat> baptism is the washing of regeneration. You know what regenerate means, don't you? To be born again. To generate again. To be born again. The waters of baptism cause you to be born again. And what's the renewing of the Holy Spirit? The changing of a sinner's mind from the love of sin to the love of righteousness. From the love of the world to the love of God. And then once we do that, we've been changed in our mind. We have to keep that process going. But that's how we, but we're really righteous because we've been changed. Is Christ's own righteousness transferred to the believer? And we've already seen that's not the case. It's not infused. But that's what they teach. You have Adam's sin infused, and so you have to change it and infuse Christ's life. Both doctrines are wrong. It's not transferred. God doesn't put something in my account that I don't deserve. Well, I guess it's undeserved in one sense, but its conditions met in another sense. And it's not imputed to the believer by faith only. Abraham was called righteous and the friend of God because his faith was a faith that believed and obeyed. James 2 talks about that. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac upon the altar? And the answer is yes. You see then how faith working together with his works created his righteous state. And so that's what the Bible teaches. Philippians 3, 2, Paul talks about this on his own. He says, and I want to be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. There's the contrast again. I can't stand before God as a sinless human being who kept the law of Moses perfectly because I did. Well, what are you going to do? I want the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. But again, the faith he's talking about in this text is an obedient faith. Even in the same book in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, he said, As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so, imputed righteousness is very simple. The Bible will put on your account, on the book of life, that you are righteous. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross of Calvary as the perfect sinless sacrifice. If you in your life turn away from sin and repentance and say, I'm going to live a better life. If you confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And if you continue to confess that faith by the way you live your life every day of your life till you die. And if you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for in order to the remission of sins. They're washed away. Then God says, he was a sinner. Now he's righteous. My son's blood took his guilt away. 
It's a shame that such false doctrines have been taught like we're talking about tonight because the gospel plan is so easy to believe and understand. So tonight, won't you hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized to become a child of God? And if you have, and you're a Christian, but you have fallen back to the world and have committed sin, one or many, and you need further forgiveness, then avail yourself of the promise that God makes in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from what? All sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And when God cleanses the Christian who has sinned again after his baptism of all of his unrighteousness, guess what he is? He's righteous. Not because of some pretend righteousness, but because his debt really is forgiven. So tonight, if you'd like to respond to the gospel in any way, be thankful for God's grace and mercy. I am. No way could any of us stand before God in any kind of right standing except by the blood of Christ and the forgiveness God offers to all of us. Thank God every morning when you wake up that you're a child of God forgiven by the blood of Christ. And beware of the false doctrine out there that tries to tell you you're saved already and nothing you do, nothing you think, nothing you say is going to harm your salvation one whit. That's the devil talking. And though the world may believe it, the Bible doesn't teach it. So follow the Bible. It has commands to be obeyed and promises to be enjoyed if you'll respond to it while we stand and sing.